Hello everyone. Welcome to the Nomads podcast. I'm your co-host Bhavya and I'm your co-host Prachi. We all know PhD is one complete adventure like none other. There exist factors that we don't know anything about when we begin our PhD. You can never expect how drastically the research project, your advisor, and the overall situation can change. Our guest today had to face all such challenges and it only made him more strong, mature and confident. From having material science as his primary interest, he now works in the quantum gravity group. Okay, welcome to the Nomads podcast. Hi, Prachi. Hi, Babe. Thank you for hosting me. So this is your sixth year, but strictly speaking, you've been working on your research, which will be a part of your thesis, for only three years. Uh, two years. Two years. Okay. Mm-hmm. Would you like to explain our listeners how did that come about? Uh, well, it's a very long story, so I don't know how in detail we want to go, but to try to make it short. Uh, it w- when I came to Houston and my plan was to just uh, come here, get some training on material science and specifically on renewable energies, I was interested in photovoltaic devices. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to get expertise on that because I know Ecuador, you know, it's mm-hmm. in the equator. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of sun over there mm-hmm. and the potential to uh, apply apply what I learned there was huge. Right. Then because of COVID and some other things, uh, funding, uh, I had to decide if I was going to stay with my first advisor Mm -hmm. or uh, move on to get a new one and start everything over. So that was a really hard decision because, you know, you have to think. My advisor, uh, when he applied for funding, he was requesting about seven hundred thousand dollars for a new equipment okay but he didn't get it oh so because of that it was very limited the things that we could do at the time right so then uh, my only task in that lab would have been to just keep growing the material Mm -hmm. as it is and trying to improve the quality but without changing any equipment Mm -hmm. and that was very challenging because they they had already worked on that project for uh, I think four years. Oh, so they already optimized everything that could be optimized. Mm-hmm. So at the time, the idea w- when I started was okay. Let's try to move to applications. Mm-hmm. We still to make better quality crystals, mm-hmm. but if we have funding, we can mm-hmm. try to work with other groups and collaborate. And uh, the material had potential. It mm-hmm. has potential. Still, it's being uh, researched. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. At the time, I had to decide, okay, since funding didn't come out, now do I switch Mm -hmm. or do I stay? And I decided to switch because all the other projects that uh, my previous advisor had were um, related to chemistry. Mm. And that's not within my expertise. Mm. And I didn't love that much (laughs) what I would be doing. So... That's why I decided to change. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I started working with Dr. Morrison. Mm -hmm. And again, because of funding, um, he offered me to work in one project first. Mm -hmm. And then if he got more funding, then he would have more flexibility. Mm -hmm. But he offered me to work on the project that he had funding for. Okay. So then I started working in this computational project about COVID because that's how he got the funding. It was COVID time. Mm -hmm. So uh, he got a grant from that. Mm -hmm. And then the idea was to uh, study the effect of uh, face-to-face essential workers Mm -hmm. and see how they impact uh, the transmission of the COVID disease. So we ended up doing a general study for any disease. You just needed to vary the parameters. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the time that uh, he was supposed to find out if he got funding, mm-hmm. he didn't. 
So I had to decide again. Oh. Oh. Uh, what do I do? Because uh, then it was that had funding, mm-hmm. so I don't have to worry during the summers. Mm-hmm. And, and then one of the options that came out uh, was another professor in computer science. He was applying for a grant. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was Carlos who uh, was helping me to uh, find potential advisors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of a coincidence when a student that he had had to go back to Italy. Right. So one position opened in his lab. Okay. Uh. So then we made a plan with the department in which I could like use my research with Dr. Morrison to get a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And after that, I would start my PhD formally uh, on Carlos Group. Right. So had you met Carlos before? Yeah, he was my professor for the quantum mechanics courses in the first year. And he was the one that interviewed me for the admission into the program. So I had, I had seen him before. And I did pretty well in the quantum mm-hmm. courses, so he was happy with me, and that's why he was like, okay, uh, I have some projects that you could work on. Are you interested? And then um, we started talking, and then things mm-hmm. worked out. And you got your master's degree in this computational project that you were doing with yes, exactly. Dr. Morrison. So, so that semester was kind of crazy because I had to write the thesis. At the same time, I was reading about general relativity. I was watching videos. Uh, there is this great professor from MIT, which I cannot remember the name, uh, that has a wonderful set of lectures uh, on GR. Mm-hmm. Oh, great. Um, and that's what I was doing. Mm-hmm. I was writing my, my master thesis mm-hmm. and I was like learning GR, learning differential geometry. Mm-hmm. So it was a crazy semester. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds yeah. tough. So before this, you also came to UIUC. Was that your first time in the US? Yes. And what project were you working on? So UIUC was a, a study exchange program. So I okay. came one year to, as part of my bachelor degree. Okay. Mm-hmm. So back home, I studied at Universidad San Francisco de Quito, which is a liberal arts school. It was founded by two physicists. Oh. So they had come here to the US to study their uh, doctorates. Mm-hmm. And then they really liked the approach to education here. And that's Mm. not something that we had back home. So at some point they were like, maybe we uh, we can apply this model to Ecuador. Mm. And uh, recently one of the founders uh, sadly passed away. So that was very Mm. sad. We got the news like a month ago. Uh, He passed away uh, last week of April. Uh So it was very sad because you know the model is really interesting right so they had this comprehensive liberal arts program and they have many uh, agreements with american universities and universities in europe Mm -hmm. so you can uh, people from here go to ecuador to study one year and people from ecuador Mm -hmm. come to universities here to do one year yeah so uh, then uh, I luckily ended up applying thanks to a friend of mine mm-hmm. and then I got selected I got a scholarship to come here so it was very nice it was a wonderful experience that's that was that's your first time nice. in America yeah it was my first time in the US I think before that I may not have gotten out of the country <laughs> ah, okay. even wow. so yeah wow. it was very nice <laughs> and uh, the language was hard at the beginning because even if you learn English mm. from a very young age in Ecuador, it's not the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. I didn't have any problems in courses. Mm-hmm, but, but outside, you go to a party, <laughs> people. <laughs> How do I order a beer? Get excited. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> people get excited and then they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> they don't slow down. They just <laughs> go really fast. Yeah. And it was very hard for me. The first three months were like. 
<laughs> very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> but you get used to it. And now I think at least my English is not as bad. <laughs> <laughs> but how was your time in general at UIUC? Uh, did you enjoy your fir- your what was it, was this one year? The yeah. entire it was ten months. So it was months, okay. the fall and the spring semester. And it was a great experience. I learned so many things. Uh, and actually, I found that uh, back at Ec- back in Ecuador, the difficulty level was higher. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. So, because that's how they wanted to close the gap. Because here, right. it's easier to get into research mm-hmm. as an undergrad. Mm, that's so true. So back home in Ecuador, you cannot really compete uh, at the experimental level uh, like doing research for undergrads uh, and we don't have a graduate program in ecuador okay mm. so the only way to compete according to them was to okay let's give you very solid basis mm-hmm. in theory so you can kind of balance the things out because oh. you don't have that much research experience but then your theoretical basis is very solid Mm, I'm sure. So you were talking about how you were writing your master's thesis in computational physics, and then you had to quickly get all the knowledge for your next research group. So how big was that leap? So it was a little bit hard in the sense that whenever you start uh, talking about new ideas, Mm Uh, like in quantum, for instance, mm-hmm. it's very hard to get used to what they mean. So uh, it was hard in the sense that I had to do many things at the same time. Yes. And also I had to learn many new ideas mm-hmm. at the same time. Mm-hmm. So that part was the hardest. That, uh, But I think what helped was mm-hmm. exactly what I was saying before that in Ecuador we got pretty strong foundations. Right. So at least the math, for instance, mm-hmm. was, OK, uh, I don't fully understand this idea mm-hmm. in this context, but I've seen something similar in this other context. Mm-hmm. Right. So at least I could like connect the dots and mm-hmm. may ha- have an easier time going okay. over that. Of course, I can still n- not say that I'm an expert on the field. Mm-hmm. Because I think that takes a huge time. Mm. But you start building up. (laughs) (laughs) So you've, um, I mean, you've spent a lot of time in academia. Um, What do you, in your opinion, what do you think has changed over these years? In what sense? Um, in your experiences, as in, like, have you seen uh, what research was happening when you came and then what's happening right now and, and other things? And that also maybe the way that people do research. Do you think mm-hmm. there's a change that has happened, the approach towards their field? I don't think that changes as fast. Mm-hmm. But what I would definitely say it has changed is my knowledge about how research is conducted, mm-hmm. how academia works. Mm-hmm. Before coming here, I was like, OK, it's so nice to be a professor. You basically go and do your research, and everything is nice. And then uh, you have your students that, that help you do your research. So mm-hmm. it seems like a wonderful life. <laughs> but uh, you don't really know about grant applications. You don't yes. really know about funding. Yes. You don't really know, OK, if I get funding, then uh, some par- some high percentage of that goes to the department. Mm. Oh, so yeah. you don't really know many things that uh, go with academia. Mm. Mm. And uh, funding is one of the things that I found that is kind of really important. Because before I was like, OK, you have to do it because you like it. Uh, but at some level, you realize that if you don't have the funding, then you can't really do what you want. That's right. right. That's right. So that has been the harshest realization. Uh, it's really complicated. Like I, 
I really like doing research. Professors can have administrative assistants uh -huh. or can have a, so someone that a, in the department that coordinates the grant applications, mm -hmm. for instance. So they only have to worry about writing the science mm -hmm. and not doing the whole process right. about, oh, but I need to put it in this format, I need to submit it in this way, I need to uh, care about all these uh, specifications. So if you have someone that helps you with that, mm -hmm. I think that would be great. I feel one cannot just choose to only do research and not do the other part of being an academic. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it, it comes with the job. Yes, yeah. yes so for sure. It's, it's com it comes with an asterisk <laughs> rather, like it's not <laughs> stated, but then you find out that you have to you do have it to anyway. Do it. Yeah, so I realized that I didn't know anything about academia. <laughs> I was like, okay, you just get tenure and <laughs> it, everything. And you're done. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it's not as, as it seems. So mm -hmm. at least you get a more realistic perspective. Mm -hmm. And it has its good sides, it has its bad sides. So you just need to know what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I'd say that. How do you compare this to, uh, you know, how academia was back in Ecuador? Back in Ecuador, it's mostly this romantic perspective because mm -hmm. uh, then because as, as undergrads, we also had to do research projects. Mm -hmm. So mine was in solid state physics. Right. So it was experimental. So mm -hmm. I've done like <laughs> different things. Um, but you don't see this need for funding. So over mm -hmm. there is more like this romantic idea. Oh, you do science because you just love it. You just want to do science. Mm -hmm. and you just want to understand something better. Mm -hmm. So over there, it does work a little mm -hmm. bit like that. Oh, so okay. that's why I didn't have this broader perspective of funding on how you still need to uh, construct all these projects from the scratch. Right. You have to have the idea, then build a collaboration, then apply for funding. So it's very comprehensive there's a lot of administrative stuff involved mm -hmm. so let's talk about your research now your recent work has been in <coughs> conformal field theory in one dimension which we know as conformal quantum mechanics so why don't we start by you explaining our listeners what is conformal quantum mechanics so let's start with conformal right. uh, Conformal means that um, your system is invariant and there are some uh, transformations. So basically it hints that there are some symmetries in your system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, specifically uh, this transformation don't change the angles between uh, straight lines. Mm -hmm. So is some things that uh, don't change when you apply a transformation. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we have just one dimension, mm -hmm. which in our case is going to be the time. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, what it means is that if we want to describe the physical states in our system, mm -hmm. um, then we can usually just use the Hamiltonian and get the time evolution mm -hmm. for the system. But uh, because you have conformality, which is this symmetry in your system, mm -hmm. then uh, you can use operators that are not the Hamiltonian to get the physical states of your system. Right. Okay. So for instance, uh, you can think uh, of a black hole mm -hmm. and in the near horizon region, uh, there is this conformal symmetry. Right. So over there, uh, if you are close to the horizon, you can apply these conformal quantum mechanics to mm -hmm. describe your system. And basically, in there, you can use uh, the dilation operator in order to describe the time evolution of your system. Right. Okay. Talking uh, about a paper that you wrote in 2022, uh, slightly getting into more detail, you studied uh, spectral properties of uh, symmetry generators in CQM, and you used the path integral approach to do it. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about the motivation of that, of that paper that you wrote? And why does this approach make it unique? So uh, the motivation is first, can we do a, 
a different approach to conformal quantum mechanics because usually you just use canonical methods mm -hmm. uh, but um, from previous work uh, of my advisor and some collaborators they were able to find what would be the propagator for a general conformal quantum mechanics operator mm -hmm. so the idea was okay so we think that this is the propagator for a general CQM operator. Mm -hmm. Can we find the spectrum of uh, these operators using path integrals? Because once you have the propagator, you can get the operators. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the main motivation. Can we do it? If, right. And if we compute some things, would this lead to... S it, is this going to be consistent mm -hmm. with uh, other methods that people have used before? And it turns out that yes, uh, we were able to re reproduce what others have done before using different approaches. Mm -hmm. And we were also able to calculate the uh, spectrum for a uh, different operator that, as far as we know, people have not done it before. OK. That's, that's great. And um, this path integral approach was was something diff had not been done in the li literature before. Yeah, as far as I know, in the, uh, it has not used be, be, it has not been used before in the context of CQM. Okay, all right. So you've also been working in the connections between Andrew effect and entanglement degradation. So would, do you want to explain what entanglement degradation or uh, let's just make sure that our listeners are on the same place. And how about you start with explaining what is entanglement and how is it central in quantum mechanics? OK, so that's a very complicated question, <laughs> but let's try to make it as simple as mm -hmm. possible. Good. So there are classical correlations that um, a correlation means a relationship between two different variables. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you can think of a the temperature and the probability of raining, mm -hmm. right? And you can see if the two variables are connected. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Now, in uh, entanglement is a type of correlation that cannot happen classically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, it's kind of a measure of how quantum your system is. Right. You can say that like taking it to a very low level. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to do it uh, more formally, you can use the mathematical definition mm -hmm. in which you use tensor products. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you say that there are two types of states. Separable states that can be decomposed uh, in terms of a tensor product of, um, let's say, one particle states. Mm -hmm. and um, others that cannot be decomposed as a tensor product. Right. Right. So if your system cannot be decomposed as a tensor product, mm -hmm. then that state is entangled. entangled. Right. Yeah. But a, in simple terms, is a type of correlation that cannot happen in a classical mechanics. Right. And, and what does entanglement degradation mean? So then uh, the level of entanglement that you can have in a state varies. OK. So um, if you start with a maximally entangled state, there are two possibilities. A maximally entangled state is a state that uh, has the maximum entanglement possible. Okay. So there are just two possibilities if you start with this. Either the, uh, the entanglement stays constant or it uh, degrades, meaning that it gets uh, less and less. OK. So uh, that's what entanglement degradation is. So this has been studied uh, before in the, uh, in the context of uh, constantly accelerated observers. Mm -hmm. And in that case, uh, it has been shown that if an uh, observer is constantly accelerated, mm -hmm. then he sees the entanglement of 
an inertial, maximally entangled state degraded. Right. So this means that uh, there is something uh, cause, co causing this entanglement to be lower. Mm -hmm. And that's where UNRU, the UNRU effect enters into the picture. Mm -hmm. So the UNRU effect says that a constantly accelerated observer sees the inertial vacuum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a, a, thermal, a thermal state with a right. temperature that's proportional to the acceleration. So that means that for an accelerated observer, the inertial vacuum is not a vacuum. Uh -huh, it's okay. a state that has particles. Okay. And these particles follow a thermal distribution mm -hmm. at a temperature that depends on the acceleration. Mm -hmm. And uh, experimentally, this is very hard to prove because you need a very high acceleration in order to find this temperature. Mm -hmm well a measurable temperature right so how do you uh, how do you measure the amount of entanglement that has been degraded so uh, since we worked in a bipartite system there are different entanglement measures that can be used and the one that we use was a uh, the logarithmic negativity so basically okay. um, it's like uh, you can quantify entanglement dif using different quantities mm -hmm. and you pick one of those Okay. We picked logarithmic negativity because it's the one that's easier to calculate. I see. So after reading your work, what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong here, what causes the this unru like effect, this thermal effect, is the apparent horizon in causal diamonds and uh, the fact that the lifetimes of the observers are finite. Is that a fair way to put it? I think yes. How would how would you put it? No, I think I think you're right because basically, uh, if you have a finite lifetime observer, that you have this kind of horizon that naturally arises, and uh, because of that, it has been shown before that you can associate a temperature to a, a finite lifetime observer, mm -hmm. which basically means that again. Uh, an observer with finite lifetime would see the Minkowski vacuum as a thermal state mm -hmm. with a temperature that turns out to be inversely proportional to the lifetime. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So because there is this thermal effect, if you again uh, start with a maximally entangled state, uh, it is expected that you will see some degradation. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the motivation. Can we prove that you get the same? Do, first, do, do we get the same? And then uh, can we prove it? Because it, it was not a given that you're going to get degradation right. uh -huh. from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So there were hints that it was going to be the case, mm -hmm. but it was not a straight, that a straightforward, at least. Right. All right. So going back to the same uh, 2022 paper, you found solutions for systems whose time evolution is governed by a hyperbolic Hamiltonian. And that is equivalent to time evolution of static observers in, uh, in causal diamonds. How does that relate? How did, did you tap into that uh, result and found your calculation for accelerated observers? Did that result mm. give you any, any hints? Can, can, can you restate your question? Because I, I th there is some relationship between conformal quantum mechanics and uh, finite lifetime observers and causal diamonds. Yeah, OK. Um, because uh, the one of the operators of conformal quantum mechanics is the one that gives the time evolution for causal diamonds. Yeah. So there is that connection, but a priori there's no uh, direct connection to entanglement. I see. OK. So Pablo, I want to take a step back here, and I want to ask you that we've talked about entanglement, and your work is based on entanglement quite a lot. And we know that uh, entanglement is extremely fundamental to quantum mechanics. But we often don't uh, give it much importance when we're talking about the textbook quantum mechanics or the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And um, I feel that becomes a major drawback 
in the Copenhagen interpretation. What do you feel about that? Uh, what what do you mean i didn't follow so them. basically when we when we're as graduate students and even as undergraduate students when we're talking about quantum mechanics when we're taught quantum mechanics uh, even the first time when we're formally you know given like we're taking a course in quantum mechanics entanglement is not something that we uh, focus on majorly and uh, i mean was that the way that you were also taught quantum mechanics the first time mm, well i mean you get to know about it right because spooky action at the yes, distance yes. so you get some hints about it but i'd say that um i i i'd say that it it, it was also not at the center of what right. I was learning, mm -hmm. but what I didn't understand was the the relationship with the Copenhagen interpretation that we were, you were asking about. So Copenhagen yes. interpretation is basically what we are the textbook interpretation of quantum mechanics that we have a wave function and the wave function evolves and as soon as we measure something, it collapses. The, it collapses. Mm -hmm. So that's primarily the way that we are taught quantum mechanics and now a lot of work has been started to uh, conduct in this field in the foundations of quantum mechanics that uh, for example people are now questioning whether this is a right approach because obviously whatever interpretation we choose it's ultimately going to give us the same results but what physicists are concerned about right now is that is this a right way to approach quantum mechanics that without understanding the foundations, without understanding what's actually happening, is should we just move forward and just use it as a tool and, you know, conduct our research? I think that's what a lot of people do. Like, uh, and even us, if you think about it, it's not that uh, when you start doing research, you already know everything. Mm -hmm. So that's how science works, at least in the practical level, mm -hmm. right? So you just use tools, you, I don't know, go to the lab, mm -hmm. prepare some things, measure some things. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't understand the full theory yet, but you are still doing something, right? right? So I think that's okay as long as you know that there are limitations mm -hmm. with that approach. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say, okay, let's wait until we have a complete understanding of quantum mechanics to start doing things. Because mm -hmm. right. we don't even know if that's, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. right. If you take f what Feynman used to say, mm -hmm. right? No one understands quantum <laughs> mechanics. True. Yeah. And I, I still, that's still the case. Mm -hmm. So sometimes a scientist, we as scientists get a lost into the idea, oh, science is the only right answer, mm -hmm. right? But I think we have to keep an open mind. Mm, that's, right. Right. that's part of what science teaches, teaches us. us. Completely. Yep. Yeah. So we cannot say the Copenhagen interpretation is wrong. Mm. Well, at least I wouldn't say that. Yeah. Okay. okay. We cannot s say uh, if we take this approach in which entanglement becomes the center, mm -hmm. this is going to lead to something productive. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Right. So we just need to keep an open mind and, okay, see what the experiments and the theories are telling us mm -hmm. and based on that maybe we can get more hints on whether we can discard or not the Copenhagen interpretation which in my opinion I don't think you really can at least at the moment because every hint is uh, still uh, pointing at the collapse of the wave function right. so if you measure something right after that you measure again you will find it in the same state mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. it collapsed. Correct, correct. So, uh, it's the teaching approach varies from different cultures, mm -hmm. different persons. So I I even every person learns differently, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So trying to find the correct approach for everyone is very hard. Mm -hmm. So we cannot really generalize mm -hmm. and I think that's part of the issue. So, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, speaking about interpretations of quantum mechanics, do you find yourself inclined to a particular inter interpretation? Uh, 
what would be the options that you give me? <laughs> what interpretations are we talking about? So Copenhagen is one. Uh, the other one is many worlds. Then there's objective collapse, spontaneous collapse, and then there's this bohemian mechanics. There's there's a lot of going, a lot of interpretations. The hi hidden variables. The hidden variable interpretation. Yeah, I'm inclined to not believe in the hidden variable one, mm -hmm. but as far as of the others, I don't know enough to really rule out or be inclined more to, mm. to one of them. So, mm. I, from what I know, I just know that the Co Copenhagen so far holds. Mm -hmm. So, mm. many worlds, uh, can we talk about that a little bit? Can you quickly go over what does it say? Because I may have an idea on which one are you talking about, but I'm not sure. So um, in the many worlds interpretation, it's uh, the f okay. Let me compare it directly to the Copenhagen interpretation. In Copenhagen interpretation, there's a there's this notion of collapse of a wave function. There, the notion of collapse is gone. So. Let's, if you see the Schrodinger's equation, that's responsible for any time evolution of, of any wave function, any state in quantum mechanics. Uh, the Schrodinger equation is, is first order, okay? And um, quantum mechanics in general is linear. It's not, it's not like classical, it's not a second order differential equation. It's not, you know, force equals ma. It's not like x double, mx double dot is equal to f. That's, it's that's a different. partial differential equation. Yeah. Yes. So uh, in the many worlds, uh, again, so in Copenhagen, when the way the collapse of the wave function cannot be described by Schrodinger's equation, because collapse is nonlinear, whereas Schrodinger's equation is linear. So so that's very so th th that is sort of axiomatic to the Copenhagen right. interpretation. It's yeah. like this is a rule. That's why the rule of collapse came into the picture. Mm. However, in the many worlds interpretation is you just have the wave function and let's say you have, you know, alpha times up plus beta times down plus zeta times something and then on and on. A lot of states are possible. So if you measure and you, found your, and you find yourself in one particular part of the wave function, it's not necessary that all the other parts are sort of deleted. I mean, those also did happen, but you just f find yourself in the part that that happened with your or with you, your measurement. You, you essentially branch out. So yeah. basically, the so the main other parts of the wave yes. functions are known as also the existing. other worlds. Yes. yes, that's why the many worlds interpretation. I mean, mm. it's sort of poetic, but the other parts, which also have a coefficient that weight the other parts of the wave function, are are the other worlds of the, I mean, there's some other technicalities going um, on, but this is like the simplest version. But other worlds mean that we cannot prove for we, the other parts of the wave function? No, they're orthogonal. So yes. Then so how, essentially how can you distinguish between the two? Between the two? The Copenhagen and the many worlds. Yeah, so The again, central idea of many worlds is that we don't need anything else other than the wave function of the universe is the central idea of many words uh, interpretation that the wave function is not necessarily y you have a different wave function and I have a different wave function. We just have one wave function for whole of the universe. And as soon as anything interacts, they become entangled. So f for example, like the uh, showing this cat experiment we have, what happens is that when the observer observes the cat, it becomes entangled. So there is one observer that observes the cat dead. So that becomes observer observing the cat dead. So in fact, what she was mentioning right now, it's you know, it's the it's the feature of decoherence in quantum mechanics mm -hmm. that allows it, allows nice. this. So it's not the observer or the state that are orthogonal. It's the environment that decoheres the state, the observed state that is orthogonal. Mm, okay, but let's go to like a lower level, right? What is m many worlds? Because if you're saying we need just a one way function for the universe, mm -hmm. and then you're talking about many worlds, so that means that we have more than one universe? Yeah, so something like that. So in the sense that, let's say you have a, this analogy comes from the fact that, I mean, this is very central that 
let's say you have an isolated system. For that isolated, isolated system, you have one wave function. So let's consider our universe as an isolated system, and let's assume that there is nothing outside the universe. So there's only one wave function that describes this universe and carries any part of the wave function carries some weight weight, weight with it, which is, which is the amplitude. And then there's, it's in a superposition of many other universes as well. That's the interpretation of many worlds. But at, at some point I read uh, one interpretation but by a professor at MIT, mm -hmm. which he proposed that there are multiverses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, you live in the particular universe in which you don't, you, you never die. Right, right. Okay. I, I, I see what you mean. So basically, it, this is very interesting. I, I don't know. I mean, there's no way to prove it, mm -hmm. uh, pr to prove it or probe it a anyways, because uh, the only fact that you know about the universe is that everyone dies. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So unless you die, you cannot prove it. Yeah. yeah. So right. like basically what you're saying is that we have, again, like a wave function. We are looking, for example, if there is, l let's say, a probability that this person will either die today or will not die today. And then the wave function branches and there's, if the person dies, if there's a universe where the person is not dying. And then again, there comes a probability, then again, the wave function branches. And in that case, there will be a universe where that person does not die at all. Yeah, it's called quantum immortality. Yeah, yeah which again, I mean, which, which is it's, a very it's, it's interesting it's to interesting, think, yeah. but again, unless we have a way of experimentally discerning between the mm -hmm. two is mm -hmm. at least, I think, not fundamental to solve unless we can right. probe it, right? Because otherwise it's just opinion. It's like religion. Mm. Yes. Does God <laughs> exist or I not? I can understand, yeah. You can say yes or no, but if you cannot make an experiment that proves it, mm -hmm. then it's just your opinion. Right. Right. Interesting. So do you think as a PhD student, one should, you know, devote some time to think about these let's say, philosophical ideas and quantum foundations in that sense. Have you, in general, thought about this? I think it's very important to think about ph philosophical questions because those influence your life. And other than a researcher, you're still a person, right? Mm -hmm. So you are not just a PhD student. You're more than that. Right. So I think, for instance, the meaning of time, the meaning of life, what you really want, what you don't, those are really important philosophical questions that go along with life. And also in science, we do have, so what's the meaning of time? Right. Oh, yes. It's yeah. a huge <laughs> deal in Absolutely. science, right? Absolutely. We cannot settle for an answer yet. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We don't understand many fundamental things because what you are trying to understand is the world, and that's very complicated. That's why I started physics. I thought, Okay, you know, um, I was studying business management. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I, I, I did yeah. that for two years. That's wow. before <laughs> I started in physics. And I was reading these books by scientists. And I was like, oh, that seems nice. It seems that physics can explain how the world works. And that seems interesting. So then I started asking and... Um, uh, I didn't study, I, I wanted to go into engineering uh, r when I was in high school, mm -hmm. but I didn't have enough money to pay for that career. So I started in business. Then I got interested in physics and uh, it turns out that there was a scholarship that I could apply for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did that and I thought, okay, uh, physics is going to explain me how the world works and it's going to give me some answers of, for questions that I have now, philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, questions about life, questions about love, questions about how the world works. And then it turns out that you actually just get more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's true. 
Yeah, it's it, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, I think philosophy is really important to guide your research. Mm -hmm. So I think thinking about both things at the same time gives give, gives you a broader perspective and lets you keep an open mind and don't close to ideas that then they may become important. And you, if you don't think about that, you just could be neglecting some uh, like other side of the story. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I think it's very important. That's nice. That's I mean, in well interestingly, said. that's precisely what I wrote in my statement of purpose, that physics not only helps you find answers, but also lets you find new questions. The, the right questions. The right questions. The right yes. questions. Very well the said. right questions for what, though? <laughs> for what? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you don't know what the right questions are, yeah. really. So but, uh, we yeah. just find some questions that we feel inclined to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that that's the right question, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's kind of a loop. <laughs> yeah. You think that you know more, but then you realize that there's so much more that you don't know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's like you're this little ant that's walking, <laughs> yeah. right? And you think that your world is this small uh, 2D space in which you're <laughs> yes. working. Yes. And then you start realizing that there's more. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you ever read the myth of the cavern. Nope. Mm. So that's very interesting. It's, I think it's Plato. I'm okay. not entirely okay. sure, but okay. I think it's Plato. So there's these people that live in a cavern mm -hmm. and they only have a one light from a fire that's happening behind them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they just see the shadows of people that are walking uh, on the other side of the cavern. So all the, the things that they can see is the shadows. So that's their world. That's all the thing they know. And they are happy with that. They are comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. They talk between them and they think that's the real world. Oh, I see. Then one of them uh, gets uh, free from uh, the chains that they have and then stands up and then turns around and sees the fire and sees the people walking. And then he realizes, oh, okay, so these shadows come from the people that are over there and it's because of the fire that we can see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all the other people don't believe him. He has gone crazy. Because <laughs> the other just don't know. Right? right. He saw a uh, new experience. Yes. And he realized that, oh, I was wrong. All my life I thought this was the case, but it's not. There's more. Yeah. Right? Oh. And then he goes out of the cave and he sees the light and he's even more impressed like now oh what's all this he gets to see trees he gets to see animals and he's like amazed but the other people think that he's he, he's, mm. cra he's crazy he became crazy yeah, yeah that's so a see very nice story. philosophy gives yeah. you some nice ideas to think about yes yep. true yep. Yeah. That's a nice way to yeah. put the whole thing into perspective. Yeah. I mean, science and physics essentially allow you to, you know, stand up and see what's going to on. To basically on go the, out of the cave and... On the shoulders of... <laughs> <Jack>. yeah. <laughs> on the shoulders of... <laughs> yes, yes. yeah. That's yeah. right. So we know now that you've been planning to move away from academia. Is there a specific reason? Like... like I personally have seen after coming to the US that a lot of universities, a lot of PhD students sort of now incline towards uh, the industry and because of the, you know, at least seven out of ten reasons are the reasons that you've stated. Mm -hmm. Some of them, the remaining are maybe personal or whatever, but most of the reasons are, you know, And statistics. this is not just UH specific. Yeah, Everyone absolutely. Everyone in the US. A lot of people. Uh, no, that's oh. uh, that's a huge problem. I yes. don't know uh, the exact statistics, but I've read a couple of articles mm -hmm. and they point to all these issues like 
we are not paid a living wage. Mm, that's right. right. So maybe at the beginning I was, but you know, inflation, so salary has not mm. been adjusted accordingly. So at some point you start thinking about this is I'm doing my PhD, but this is also my life. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's right. So another interesting question: Should PhD be considered as training, or it's a job? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. Very polemic issues. <laughs> and we should post this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not just US. I mean, we have friends from other continents yeah. saying that saying the same thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. As as a beginner in PhD, I mean, you these things hit you a lot. I mean, because mm -hmm. you said like I personally also share a very romantic relationship with with physics, but then you know you're dragged to this practical realm that you know things are not romantic all the time. You have to be very practical about these things, especially the funding situation. Something I was also not, if not completely, but like I was not very well aware of what's what's going to happen mm -hmm. once you once you come here. But yeah, very well said. And it becomes really difficult because uh, this is your life that you're pacing on. And if you want to completely concentrate on your research and enjoy it fully, you have to have a secure life otherwise. Yes. Mm, yeah, so the work-life balance, work-life, mm. work-life balance, sorry. <laughs> it's very important. Yes. Yes, extremely. It's extremely important to, to realize that it is five years of your life that you're investing, at least. Yes, totally. Right? So, yes. So Completely agree. Talking about your life, you got married in 2018 to your lovely wife, Evelyn. Mm -hmm. How has your journey been together in the U.S., working? And you mentioned that you started your married life Precisely in the U.S. Because yeah. you got married in 2018 and you came to U.S. in 2018. So how has this journey been? So it's been hard and beautiful because you don't know what you're going into, right? Mm -hmm. Marriage is something new. Moving out to another country is new. So we had so many new things happening at once that at the very first was really hard to think, uh, to stop and think mm -hmm. what's happening. So it's just life keeps throwing you mm -hmm. stuff, right? Uh, but as time has been passing, we have been able to pause a little bit more and discuss. And of course, there's always disagreements, but I think the uh, key is communication like re realizing how to communicate, what's effective, what's not effective, because in the end, you, you are two different persons, right? Mm -hmm. Sharing a life. And uh, you have to find common ground, but you also need your own experiences. Right. So it's very important to try to balance both. That's, that's nice. That's right. And I mean, I'm sure that it must have been extremely hard for Evelyn as well, because like I said, like you got married, you came here, and you knew that what you're going to do here. But I'm sure she had to restart her life all over again. Yeah, exactly. So uh, she knew that she didn't want to do a PhD, for instance. Mm -hmm. Uh, but she wanted to continue to work. So at the beginning, it was hard because many new things, mm -hmm. even the language, because you mm -hmm. do have to go through all this process. And uh, then uh, she found a job. Uh, she was working on that. Uh, she was doing fine. Then she found another job, and now she's even happier. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Yeah, it's been a wild ride because in between all these findings and everything, there's a process that you need to learn. Right. Yes. Because that's one of the things that you realize when you come to a new country. Mm -hmm. You don't know how things work. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So, for instance, just uh, how to use the insurance, where mm -hmm. can I go, where I can't, <laughs> uh, what should I do? 
all those things that you take as a given back in your country are new for you here. Oh, yes, mm. absolutely. So, if you if you could, is there anything that you would want to change in your life? Like, if you could go back and change something, is there anything you would want to change? I can philosophy, and <laughs> these what ifs are really not that good for uh, you if you start th thinking what ifs. Mm -hmm. That's actually just may put you in a loop or what if I had done this differently? What if I had done that differently? Right. Uh, in my opinion, if you, you want to change something, you don't know where you would end up to because mm. you just have this imaginary like reasoning in which you say, mm -hmm. okay, if I had done this thing differently, then I would be in that position. But you don't know that. Yeah. So for instance, in me, I could say just a random thing mm -hmm. what if i didn't uh, switch advisors when i did right maybe now i'd be graduated mm -hmm. and have a good job mm. i don't know maybe mm. i would be back in ecuador because i didn't like it or maybe i would be ceo in a company <laughs> or yeah. maybe yep. i would have published i don't know 50 research papers mm. we don't really know mm -hmm. so just tormenting yourself with I should have done this differently I don't think it's the right thing to do lastly what advice what what is the best advice that you've ever received mm. okay these are hard questions <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is harder than science <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess it would be to, to, to be open, to keep an open mind and to doubt everything that other people tell you. I think that's the most valuable lesson that I've learned. And, and this was back in my home university. And another lesson would be that we are all equal and we are all persons with the same value no mm -hmm. matter what you do no matter what happens we all have the same value it doesn't matter if you like have a thousand published papers or one or zero you hold the same value as a person than others mm -hmm. uh, and for instance in my previous university we used to just uh, treat everyone by their first name mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yeah and that was great i find that amazing and i really miss that I agree, here I, I, I i still feel that some people like to be called doctor or yeah. professor or whatever which I, makes a distinction yeah you. exactly yeah. and yeah okay you got a phd but so what your yeah. value as a person is still the same you're right and the person becomes more unapproachable once you have to think before addressing that person yeah, so it just creates barriers. So yeah. that's, that's what I don't like. Mm -hmm. So this, the one of the founders, the one that passed away, that he used to tell us the first day that you come to the, the, the university, he would say, OK, you can tell me Santiago. Mm. Mm. You can call me like that. You don't need to use any titles, anything. You just call me by my first name. And you have to do that with everyone in the university. Yes. And yes, the idea was that just let's tear down barriers. Let's not create more. Hmm. Mm. So wow. why would you just say, OK, ah, I got a PhD? Because sometimes we are like, oh, yeah, PhD, a professor. <laughs> oh, wow. No, we're all persons, right? Mm -hmm. So we may do some things. We may do others. The, the person working at the bakery is as important as the person doing research. Oh, yes. Yep. So absolutely. Wow, that's that's wonderful, Pablo. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank, Thank you. you for hosting me.